We're going to be in Revelation 9 and Revelation 16. Now, you remember in chapter 2 of Genesis, there were four rivers mentioned, right? Pison, Gihon, Hidekel, and Euphrates. Okay? And those were mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 as being rivers that came out from the Garden of Eden. There was a river that went through the Garden of Eden, and then it parted into four heads, and one of those heads became the river Euphrates. Now, just to give you a rough idea of where the river Euphrates is, you know, since I got this handy map right here, this is the Persian Gulf, okay? And the river Euphrates stretches all the way from Turkey, modern-day Turkey or Asia Minor, all the way to the Persian Gulf. This is one of the longest rivers in the world. That's not the longest, but it's, it's almost like, I, I think it's about 1,730, 1,740 miles long. Some people calculate it a little differently, but... It's around 1,700-some miles long. I mean, it's a very long river. It's a serious river. And it kind of divides up the geography here, okay? It performs this natural barrier, and the Bible talks about it a lot. He talks about uh, the children of Israel having everything from the river Euphrates all the way to the Nile River in Egypt. And he talks about uh, the king of Babylon taking over the, the possessions from Euphrates unto the Nile River. And so it's a major river that forms a natural boundary. It's one of the largest rivers in the world. It's not in the top ten, but it's still a very huge, long, major river. Now, why is that significant? In Genesis, you, you stay in Revelation, but in Genesis 3, it says, He drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, this may shock you, but they're still there. Now you say, whoa, wait a minute, you got to be kidding me. Nope, they're still there. I'll prove it to you. Look at the Bible. It says in Revelation chapter 9, in verse 13, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, I heard the number of them. Now, keep your finger in Revelation 9, go to Revelation 16. You see, in Revelation chapter 9, we're reading about the seven trumpets of God's wrath. In Revelation 16, we have the seven vials of God's wrath. Now, a lot of people have misunderstood what I've preached about this. I'm not saying that the seven trumpets are the same as the seven vials. Well, it's two different things. But I'm saying that they take place at the same time. And it's very clear that the events taking place with the seven trumpets are taking place at the same time as the events of the seven files. Because if you read the book of Revelation, chapters 1 through 11 are in chronological order. Then all of a sudden you get to chapter 12, and boom, you're back at the birth of Jesus Christ. And then it's in chronological order all the way to the end of the book. So it's very simple. You just divide Revelation right down the middle. 1 through 11 is in chronological order. Then it starts over in chapter 12 with the birth of Christ, goes through the tribulation again, the rapture again, and God's wrath again from a different perspective. Sort of like we have the four Gospels. He gives us two perspectives. The events of the seventh vial and the seventh trumpet are clearly the same event. It's Jesus Christ taking over his kingdom. It's done. It's finished. Lightnings, thunderings, and earthquake. That's it. The kingdoms of our Lord have become the kingdoms, or the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Now, if you notice, if you put the trumpet judgments and the vial judgments side by side, they're parallel. For example, the first judgment, is, it talks about being poured out on the earth or uh, smiting the earth. The second judgment smites the sea. The third judgment smites the rivers and the fresh fountains of water. The fourth judgment smites the sun. The fifth judgment is when the fifth trumpet is blown and the bottomless pit is open or hell is open and smoke comes out of the bottomless pit that darkens the sun and darkens the sky. And that's when those uh, locusts from hell come out and start tormenting everyone. Well, when you look at the fifth vial, what's the fifth vial judgment? Darkness upon the face of the whole earth. So you can see how they're both side by side. When you get to the sixth judgment, remember the sixth trumpet was blown and it said, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. What four angels bound in the river Euphrates? Why would there be four angels bound in the river of Christ? Because God sent those angels there in Genesis chapter 3 to guard the tree of life. Now, look if you would at chapter 16, 
where he has the sixth vial. Notice what happens when the sixth vial is poured out. It says in verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. Now, what was the sixth trumpet? It was when he loosed the four angels that were in the river Euphrates. Well, the sixth vial, he says, uh, he poured it out upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs on up. For sake of time, I'm not going to go into all this about the sixth trumpet and the sixth vial. But it's clear that those four angels today are located in the bottom of the river Euphrates. And that they will be loosed when the river Euphrates is dried up to prepare the way of the kings of the east that they might cross the river Euphrates and come from the east into Israel, into the place of Armageddon, the final battlefield where Jesus Christ is going to come on a white horse with all the saints with him and do battle with the Antichrist and destroy the Antichrist kingdom and set up his kingdom on this earth, the millennial reign of Christ. Now, there's a lot of things we can learn from this. Uh, first of all, we can see that cherubims are called angels. Because in the Old Testament, he called them cherubims. And in the New Testament, he called them what? Angels. Now, what, what is a cherubim? I'm just gonna, or a cherub. I'm going to go through this just really quickly for a sec, because we're already out of time. But First of all, the singular is cherub. The plural is cherubims. So when you get into the plural, you add three letters, I-M-S. That's because the I-M ending is the Hebrew plural ending, so they just retained that in the English for some reason. Going from cherub to cherubims. And then there's another term called the seraph. That's singular. And then seraphims is plural. Go to just a couple of places with me quickly. Go to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. What are the cherubims like? What do they look like? Well, do you remember in the New Testament in Revelation 4, when John is caught up into heaven and he sees what the Bible calls four beasts, right? And the four beasts, they each have four wings, and the Bible says one of them had a face like a lion, one of them had a face like a calf, one of them had a face like a man, and one of them had a face like a flying eagle. So they're all different one from another. And they all have four wings. And they were full of eyes. And the Bible says they rest not day nor night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which, which was and is and is to come. So let me ask you something. Are these things human? <laughs> Not, okay. Now, these things are described in Ezekiel chapter 1, the same things, and I'll, and I'll show it to you, I'll prove it to you. It says in verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four, what are the next two words? Living creatures. Now, in the New Testament, the Bible uses the word beast. In the Old Testament here, he's using the word living creature, but it means the same thing, right? It means the exact same thing. When he says living creature in Ezekiel, and he says beast, these two words are used interchangeably in Genesis also. Genesis 1 and 2, he uses beast and living creature interchangeably. But in the New Testament, he only calls the cherubim beasts, and he calls them living creatures in the Old Testament. He says the living creatures, this was their appearance, they had the likeness of a man. So they were similar in shape to a man. But here's the difference. Everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. Now, do men have four faces and four wings? No. Now, did the cherubims in Revelation 4 have four faces each? No. No. They each had a face different one from the other. These have each one four faces, okay? And everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Is that human? No. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on the four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings, and their wings were joined one to another, and turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward, and, and so on. I'm not going to go on through the whole chapter. Go to chapter 10. He describes these living creatures in chapter 1 in great detail, and he's very clear in chapter 10 verse 15, he sees the same creatures again in chapter 10. But this time he puts a name to them. He says in verse 15, and the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw 
by the river of Kibar. So he says, you know what, that living creature I saw that I told you about earlier, guess what, it was a cherubim, or a cherub, it was cherubims. Look at verse 22, or verse 21 rather. Actually, verse 20. This is the living creature that I saw under the God, under the God of Israel by the river of Kibar, and I knew that they were the cherubims, okay? So, the living creature is the same as the cherubims, is the same as the beasts of Revelation 4. What is the common denominator? They are creatures, living creatures, not human, that have four wings each. That's the common denominator. Now, there's another living creature, you don't have to turn there, described in Isaiah 6, called a seraph. And the seraphims have six wings each. That's the difference, okay? Now, why is that? Because the word seraphim comes from the root word that means six. And cherry bibs come from a root word meaning four. That's where those words come from. That's what the Bible is distinguishing here. A living creature, a beast, not human, with four wings or six wings respectively. You say, why does that matter? Because you might say, Pastor Anderson, it's really far-fetched for me to believe that they're just sitting there under the water of the river Euphrates all this time, just sitting there for thousands of years, just waiting. And then the water there is going to be dried up, and then they're going to be released. And you're telling me they've been there since the Garden of Eden was there? Obviously, what must have happened is that the Garden of Eden was submerged completely underwater in the flood or some kind of a geographical change, because it used to be right next to Euphrates, now it's under the river Euphrates. Obviously, God didn't want us to see it, didn't want us to know about it. Just like, it seems like they never find Noah's Ark. They always want to find it, and they think they're going to find it. You know, I think God wants us to have faith in His Word. Amen. Not to see evidence. You know, and if we just saw four cherry bibs guarding the tree of life with a flaming sword, you're going to say, you know, maybe the Bible is true. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe evolution is not true. You know, maybe there wasn't a Science can't explain this. You know, everybody who goes there gets chopped in half with a flaming sword. <laughs> now, obviously God covered up the Garden of Eden with water, submerged in water, and made it in a place that's hidden according to his purpose. And it's in a huge, deep river that no one can really search out all the depths of. Period. Not going to happen. You're not going to find it. If you do find it, your scuba gear is going to get chopped in half with a flaming sword. Okay? <laughs> but, you say, Pastor Anderson, I find it far-fetched that they're just sitting there for 6,000 some years. It sounds boring. Hanging out in the bottom of the river Euphrates for 6,000 years. You know, are we... Is it time yet? I'm ready to lead those 200,000 horsemen and slay the third part of men. You know, when are we going to do this? I'm ready to start swinging my flaming sword. But you got to remember these things aren't human. Because remember in Revelation 4, it says that the cherubims, the, the four beasts, they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, to us, that would probably get boring. Chanting that over and over again, day and night, for thousands of years. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is, is. You know, it's just God is so deserving of praise and glory. That has to just be shouted about him every day, all day, 24-7, constantly. He's being praised by these things. But as a human being, we're made in the image of God. We would not be satisfied to spend our life doing that. Sounds boring, right? Just saying the same thing over and over again. Sounds boring, hanging around the bottom of the river. But these things aren't human. I mean, look at look at animals. They're called beasts. Now, they're not the same as animals like we know animals necessarily. But they are beasts or living creatures. And think about a hamster. Now, we have a hamster. It just runs in the wheel. That seems pretty boring. I mean, its whole life consists of just eating, licking itself, and... You know, they lick their hands and, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And then they just run in the wheel. And you look at that and you say, what a worthless existence. <laughs> or what about a panda? A panda bear just lays on its back all day, sleeps all day, and eats bamboo. That's it. But that's what God created it to do. Right. And God created these beasts to just praise Him all day. God created these other beasts to just hang out in the bottom of Euphrates with a flaming sword, and someday they're going to get to have some serious, you know, battles. But until then, they're just waiting. And obviously, he created them to be really patient. 
<laughs> and just like he created animals that can do stuff that's boring and we, you know, they're not human, okay? But anyway, 